Hi, good morning. Um, thank you for joining the webinar today. Um, my name is Sari Billick, and I am the public health organizer at Human Impact Partners. Human Impact Partners is based in Oakland, California, but uh, we do work nationally. I'm really excited to share with all of you some exciting work that we've been doing at the intersection of public health and social justice. So I'm gonna start with um, an overview of Human Impact Partners um, and our theory of change and how we approach our work. I'll then talk about our advocacy work highlighting two of our projects, Public Health Awakened and the Health Instead of Punishment Program. I'll then move into sharing some of the immigration work we've been doing, uh, starting with a little bit of historical and political context um, and talking about health impacts um, of increased immigration enforcement and immigration policy. I'll then provide a quick overview of the Public Health Actions for Immigrant Rights Guide or FAIR Guide, and after that we'll have time for questions. So I wanted to start with a little bit about Human Impact Partners. We're a national nonprofit that's working to transform policies people need to live healthy lives by increasing the consideration of health equity and decision making. Through research advocacy and capacity building, we're bringing the power of public health to campaigns and movements for a just society. And again, we're based in Oakland, California, um, but our work is national. We focus on several issue areas, including criminal justice, economic security, immigration, housing, land use, and transportation. So to understand HIP's approach, um, HIP is Human Impact Partners, uh, I want to share our theory of change and how we think about power and oppression. We believe that everyone has the right to be healthy and happy, regardless of nationality or legal status, race, ethnicity, gender, income, sexual orientation, ability, education, age, geography, and criminal record. We also believe that our individual health is interconnected to our communities. We live in relationship with each other. We know that inequities in the social determinants of health drive health inequities, and we focus a lot of our attention on addressing this. But we also think that looking at what drives those inequities is key to achieving equity. So that means looking at the unequal distribution of power imbalances um, between communities and ways in which those power imbalances are maintained by different forms of oppression. In other words, racism, classism, sexism, et cetera, are about reinforcing power and privilege. We must understand and address this distribution of power in order to create health equity. As part of our advocacy work, we're engaging public health professionals to be active in social and racial justice work. We do this through two different programs, Public Health Awakened and the Health Instead of Punishment program. I'll give an overview of both of these projects and then walk through some of the advocacy work we have done around immigration, which really sits at the intersection of these two projects. Okay, so knowing our approach, you can imagine that the 2016 presidential election forced us to stop, regroup, and identify how we were gonna shift our strategies to achieve our vision. At the end of 2016, we created a Google group to stay connected with other health equity colleagues and to organize ourselves better. We called it Public Health Awakened, and now, two years later, we have over 1,500 members in 47 states, as well as DC and several, other, um, and several people from other countries as well. So Public Health Awakened is a national network of public health professionals organizing for health equity and justice. We're calling on public health nonprofits, government agencies, academics, students, and others to courageously step up and use their power, their evidence, voice, and resources to protect and promote people's lives and communities. You can learn more about our work um, by visiting our website, which is right there on the screen, publichealthawaken.com. And there you can view some of our resources um, and learn how to get involved. So we have a bold vision for the future, a future where people live in healthy and equitable communities, where public health has power to advance social justice, 
a spirit of activism and advocacy is normalized within public health. Social justice organizations recognize public health as partners in their movements, where public health and equity advocates have a home from which to take action. And the narrative about what public health is and the value we bring has changed. So as I sort of alluded to earlier, we view the in, um, involvement in the criminal justice system as an important social and structural determinant of health. Therefore, we see working towards health equity um, also means working towards criminal justice reform. So our health instead of punishment program uses research and advocacy with grassroots partners to take action for justice and health equity and build the capacity of public health to engage in criminal justice reform. So we're fighting for a world where decision makers, including justice and immigration agencies, do no harm, are accountable to marginalized communities, and invest in the conditions needed for health for all. So to realize this vision, we use the following strategies. Um, we're making this vision tangible by winning justice reform policies and budget campaigns. We're making this vision scalable by building the base of public health workers advocating for justice and liberation. We want to make it real by ensuring accountability to equity in the implementation of justice policies and practices. And then lastly, make the vision sustainable by shifting culture and activating narratives that nurture health equity. So, Moving into a specific example of our advocacy work, there's been really a lot to respond to in the last two years and more. Um, but one issue we've really focused on, particularly through Public Health Awaken, is immigrant rights. Um, the increased criminalization of immigrants and using a public health lens to support immigrant communities. And we know that this isn't um, an issue that's always addressed by public health. Um, and so we've really been trying to draw those connections between immigration and health and what are the health impacts of um, immigration policies. So while this work has mostly happened within Public Health Awakened advocacy work that I mentioned, it's also an issue that really closely intersects with our criminal justice reform work. Um, in our view, addressing the mass criminalization and detention of immigrants is a fundamental part of advancing our criminal justice reform agenda. And so we see these issues as connected. Um, soon after the 2016 election, Public Health Awaken created a crowdsourced resource on immigrant rights called the um, FAIR Guide. And I'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But first, what I wanted to do is give a little bit of historical and political context to the issue of immigration policy and the ways that it's been manipulated as a tool of exclusion. Um, and also talk a little bit about its impact on health. Um, and I just want to point out that there's obviously a lot more um, history than we can cover today, um, but this is just to, meant to be a small snippet of the larger context of um, where we see ourselves today. So, um, when used unfairly, the immigration system can perpetuate structural racism. Through it, we as a society decide who belongs and who is other. Uh, and I just want to be clear that by structural racism, we're not talking about interpersonal racism, where someone doesn't like or discriminates against people of another race or ethnicity. Um, by structural racism, I'm talking about the norms in our culture based on generations of institutional and cultural practices that have allowed privileges associated with whiteness and disadvantages associated with people of color to endure and adapt over time. So let's take a look back at the origins of our nation. The political entity that we call the United States, which was built on land obtained through genocide and forcible displacement of Native Americans was founded by white men. At the time, only white Protestant males could own property and only, only property owners could be citizens and only citizens could vote. Political power was therefore exclusively available to white male Protestants. The 1790 Naturalization Act reaffirmed that any alien being a quote, free white person, really meaning male, uh, could become a US citizen, thereby excluding women and people from all other racial groups. Native Americans were particularly targeted because of not being white, but also not being foreign born, and were not actually granted full citizenship until 1924. 
So zooming forward in our nation's history, I wanted to share a couple key moments. The Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 banned Chinese immigration altogether. This was the first immigration law that prevented an entire ethnic group from immigrating to the US and it wasn't repealed until 1943. The Immigration Act of 1924 established the border control to stop immigration from Mexico. Um, this was really the first time that we created um, the concept of legal and illegal immigrants and set immigration quotas based on national origin. In effect, what this meant was increasing the number of British and Western European immigrants and reducing the number of Jewish and Arab immigrants and banning immigration from Asia outright. Um, these quotas remained in place until the 1965 Immigration Act, which significantly shifted the demographics of immigrants that were coming to the US. So then in 1942, 120,000 Japanese Americans were forcibly moved into internment camps for three years. Also in 1942, the Bracero program was created, um, which was a temporary work program to bring millions of workers to the US to address labor shortages. In 1954, what was referred to as Operation Wet Back deported over 1 million Mexican immigrants with little attention to the immigration and citizenship status of those deported. And then from the 1960s to the 1990s, wars across the world and US military intervention forced people from their homes, um, and many ended up in the US to live free from danger and seeking refuge. In 1990, um, the US created the Temporary Protected Status, or TPS, um, giving visas to immigrants who were not able to safely return to their home country because of armed conflict, environmental disaster, or other um, extraordinary and temporary conditions. And then lastly, after the September 11th attacks in 2001, we saw U.S. immigration policy increasingly based on national security, fear, and xenophobia, and enforcement was moved to what was then the newly formed Department of Homeland Security. So that's a lot, um, but the reality is that our immigration pro policy was pretty broken long before the Trump administration entered the White House. This is a quote from the American Immigration Council, which is a nonprofit think tank. The, it says, the federal government has for nearly two decades been pursuing an enforcement first approach to immigration control that favors mandatory detention and deportation over the traditional discretion of a judge to consider the unique circumstances of every case. The end result has been a relentless campaign of imprisonment and expulsion aimed at non-citizens, a campaign authorized by Congress and implemented by the executive branch. So if you've been following the news, you know that it's been a constant assault on immigrants and communities of color, not just in the immigration space. So I wanted to share just a few highlights or really what can more accurately be described as low lights um, from the last couple of years. So in September of 2017, Trump announced the end to the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival or DACA program. Uh, this put 800,000 young immigrants who came to the US as children at risk of deportation and losing their ability to work in the US. While the program has not yet officially ended, the fate of DACA is still caught up, caught up in legal battles. Then over the past year, the administration has ended temporary protected status, which I mentioned earlier, or TPS, for 300,000 immigrants from six different countries. Many TPS recipients have been in the US for literally decades. Um, they have children and family who are citizens, and they're deeply integrated into the economy and now risk deportation as well as losing their jobs, homes, and businesses. Then we all know that in April of last year, Attorney General Jeff Sessions announced a zero tolerance policy, then, sorry, then Attorney General Jeff Sessions, um, and uh, the zero tolerance policy was um, prosecuting all individuals who attempt to cross the border as criminals and forcibly separating them from their children and detaining thousands of children in makeshift detention centers across the country. And just in the past few weeks, we all have seen this, um, that 
we've seen the longest government shutdown in history, um, this overfunding for a border wall. And throughout all of this, we've seen continued ice raids in homes, workplaces, and public spaces, and assaults on sanctuary cities. These policies and the criminalization of immigrant communities are a direct contradiction to our public health values, values of equity, valuing every life, and preventing harm. Folks come to the U.S. to improve their lives, often in response to poverty, violence, and oppression. And unfortunately, public health and some uh, and public health sometimes, and particularly local government, has really um, had a history of being complicit in mass deportations. For example, during the Great Depression, two, two million Mexican American people were deported, including one million U.S. citizens. County social workers um, played a role in deporting people by telling them that they would lose their public assistance benefits and then actually buying them train tickets to Mexico. I want to share just a few numbers to put the current political context in perspective. There are an estimated 11 million undocumented immigrants currently living in the U.S. 400, or sorry, 4,500,000 children who are U.S. citizens live in families in which at least one person is undocumented. And over 150,000 uh, over 150,000 children per year have a parent deported. It's also important to remember that um, deportation as well as the threat of deportation affect not only undocumented people, but also their children and family members who are documented, um, anyone who may be perceived to be an immigrant based on skin color or other factors, um, and other people with whom they share communities or schools and also the broader community, the broader community and society. In July of last year, um, Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar said that under 3,000 children had been separated from their families and were still in federal custody. To be really clear, this is, there's never been an accurate count of how many children were and still are detained. Although Trump signed an executive order to stop this practice, there's, there are hundreds of children who are still separated from their parents, and there's really no clear path to reunite them. And just last week, the administration said that they don't have the capacity to find and, tra find and track all those children who are still not accounted for. So I want to talk a little bit about like, the health impacts of these policies. There's really a lot of ways that immigration enforcement and even just the fear of deportation affects people's health. Um, so people may be afraid to drive, um, afraid to use parks and exercise outdoors, afraid to use public services like clinics, and afraid to get involved in their communities. Research shows that fear of deportation and deportation of a parent or loved one affects kids' health and family health and can lead to poor child health, poor child educational outcomes, poor child behavioral outcomes, as well as poor adult health and a shorter lifespan. As part of our research um, that we've done at Human Impact Partners on the health impacts of detention and deportation, we did a survey that showed that deportation or the threat of deportation causes stress and trauma, including mental health issues among kids. Nearly one out of three undocumented parents in the report said that their U.S. citizen kids are afraid either all or most of the time. Nearly half said that their child had been anxious and three quarters said that a child has shown symptoms of PTSD. Other research shows poor birth outcomes. Um, a recent study found that 24%, found a 24% increase in risk of low birth weight among infants born to Latina mothers after a major immigration raid, went, raid compared to birth weight rates before the raid. Uh, fear of deportation makes law enforcement more difficult. People who witnessed or are victims of a crime are much less likely to report the crime or cooperate as witnesses. If they fear deportation or um, question about immigration status for either themselves or someone that they know. 
It makes victims of violence less likely to go to the police. Domestic violence victims in particular often remain with their abuser rather than risk being detained and or deported when seeking protection from an abuser. And of course, it exacerbates mental health issues. Um, both documented and undocumented immigrants experience exacerbated health conditions like stress, anxiety, and hopelessness due to fears of deportation for themselves or for members of their community. So I wanted to move into what we can do. In 2016, as part of our Public Health Awaken Network, we created the Public Health Actions for Immigrant Rights Guide, or FAIR Guide as we call it, in response to a climate of heightened immigration enforcement and attacks on the rights of immigrant communities. The FAIR Guide is made up of nine action steps that public health departments can take to support undocumented immigrants and their families. And while it's really written for public health departments, um, the guide in general can be used more broadly um, within public health. Health departments in particular are often providing direct health services to undocumented immigrants and their children and can therefore really be a key resource um, in supporting immigrant health. Barriers to accessing health can be exacerbated during times of political uncertainty. So even something as simple as putting up welcoming signage or publicly stating the agency's commitment to serving all people or having know your rights info on what to do in case of an encounter with ICE can be extremely helpful. And this slide shows a couple different examples of health departments who have put up welcoming signage um, in their lobbies, in their clinics, um, that just have a message as simple as all are welcome here or you're safe here. Um, your health coverage has not changed. We're here for you. It's also important to look at internal agency policies and avoid collecting patient data that could be used to deport undocumented people and also train staff on topics such as how to identify the needs of mixed status families and how to handle interactions with ICE at a clinic or hospital. These action steps in the guide are really meant to be a starting place and different agencies will likely take action in really different ways depending on the context and the population that they're working with. So I wanted to just highlight um, just a few of um, those action steps. So one, connect undocumented clients and their families with legal rights and community organizing groups. Two, join and build alliances that cross issue areas, including immigration. And three, encourage and support the efforts of sister agencies, including criminal justice, to protect undocumented people and their families. We know that there's countless local and national groups that have been doing this work in communities forever, and it's really important that health departments and public health workers use them as resources while building relationships with those groups. Um, we really think that public health can be a powerful partner to social justice movements. Uh, public health folks can support social justice uh, work by building alliances, providing data and expertise, or sharing information. Um, and they can also um, provide support by really just showing up in spaces where often public health um, is not present, start to build relationships and connect um, those issues to public health. We know that in this environment, um, there's many marginalized groups that are under attack and it's really important to remember that our issues are intersectional and, we, and think about ways that we can support um, the, a wide variety of issues. The full guide um, is, um, has details, has all nine of the action steps listed, and then it has details um, on what implementation of each of these action steps could look like, um, as well as links to resources. So I'd really encourage you to check it out. At the bottom of the screen um, is a direct link to that guide, um, but you can also access it on uh, publichealthaweekend.com. Um, at that link, in addition to the full guide, um, there's also a slide deck that's open for people to use um, that's available in English, Spanish, and Arabic and goes along with the guide. Um, so that wraps up my presentation. Um, you can contact me at this email address if um, you have any questions later, if you want any more information. Um, and I'd also really encourage you to, to check out both the Human Impact Partners website, which is there on your screen, as well as the Public Health Awakened website. 
Um, and if you want to join our Public Health Awakened network, I'd really encourage you to do so. Um, it's a way to stay connected to the work that we're doing. We regularly share resources, and particularly a lot of what we're sharing is action items, way to, ways to plug in to different social justice movements, um, mostly at a um, national level. Um, and so the link is in the box to directly join that network. So if you go again to publichealthawaken.com, there's links to join the network. Um, so I think that um, we'll open it up for questions. Excellent, uh, thank you so much. Um, so we'll, yeah, we'll open it up for questions. Please feel free to uh, write yourself or write in using uh, the chat function or uh, the Q&A function. So I see a couple questions here about uh, people wondering about their registration. So uh, when you logged in, that uh, name and email address you entered will be what I uh, what I use for your registration. Um, so yeah, we have plenty of time for uh, Q and A. So yeah, please feel free to write in uh, yeah through the chat if you have questions. Um, are there any federal policies that your organization is pushing for that would help reform immigration? Yeah, great question. So um, we um, don't specifically have a um, federal policy platform. Um, I think that um, we really take and um, you know, apologies for not really explicitly saying this. We we really take leadership for from. Uh, organizations um, that are doing the work within um, immigrant communities and other communities that we work with on other issues. And so um, we um, have been focusing a lot on um, responding to, in many ways, the work we've been doing has been fairly reactive, responding to some of what's happening at a federal level. Some of the things I mentioned, family separation, ending of DACA and TPS, um, the government shutdown and funding for the wall. Um, there are a lot of really good policies out there and um, we, we don't have a specific policy platform, but we are staying close communication with groups who are advocating for those. And as our network grows and builds and we become more established, you know, um, we, we do want to shift to being less reactive and more proactive um, to support uh, those policies that uh, partner organizations are promoting. Awesome. Uh, yeah, a lot of questions coming in here. So uh, how did you get started with HIP? Yeah, so, um, so my personal background, um, as was said in my bio, is um, in union organizing and community organizing. Um, and so um, for many years I've been working in uh, organizing low-income workers um, and immigrants uh, and uh, low-income tenants in various settings. Um, and a lot of my union organizing work was in um, healthcare. Um, and I came to HIP, um, Human Impact Partners, uh, about two years ago um, when HIP was really making a transition um, from our work really focusing on research and capacity building to thinking a lot more about how do we bring more advocacy into our work. So um, our work at Human Impact Partners has always been in partnership with um, community organizations and community organizing groups. So a lot of our research work um, is in partnership with community organizing groups who are trying to advance some sort of policy or program um, and want to bring a public health lens into that work. So the issue, the issue areas I mentioned um, are, are really not issues that public health often focuses on. And so we're um, try to be in a space of pushing public health um, to to work on different issues than they normally work on. So um, in that shift um, to thinking about, okay, you know, we're, we're responding to the 2016 election. Um, HIP really um, made an intentional decision to, to start organizing public health uh, professionals, right? Um, and, and make that a priority in addition to um, our research and capacity building. 
Um, and so I was brought on um, to think about how do we actually organize public health professionals. Um, and so I came in bringing my union organizing experience, my community organizing experience, um, and you know, to think strategically about what is building a national network um, of public health professionals look like. So there's a lot of professional organizations, um, you know, APHA, other groups um, that do some amount of policy advocacy. Um, there are lots of public health organizations that do advocacy, but we really felt like we were, um, with Public Health Awakened, pushing um, a sort of different agenda that was much more ad, uh, action focused, right? So rather than just sharing information, um, we want to move people to action. And so, um, Part of my role at Human Impact Partners has been to develop that strategy um, of what does that look like and how do we actually build something that's shifting the field of public health. Um, and so I'm bringing in a lot of different experience that um, in some ways feels, you know, feels separate than public health, but we want to we wanna bridge public health and organizing. And so how do we take concepts from community organizing, right, power building and um, engagement and action into the field of public health? So, okay, so um, you might, might have known, but a lot of our audience today is uh, undergraduate students. Um, so what are some ways that they can get involved um, with federal policy issues through Public Health Awakened, if there are any. Yeah, great. So, um, as I mentioned, I would encourage you to join our network. And joining our network really just means joining the listserv. It's a Google group. Um, so, the publichealthawakened.com, um, you can go to that. And um, I'll just pull up the slide again. Um, and uh, you can join our network there. Um, and um, or you can go directly to the link on the screen that's um, the bit.ly uh, slash join PHA. Um, so once you get connected to our listserv, um, it's, so it's, a, it's an open group, so um, you know, it's two-way communication, so we send out emails, but also um, lots of people in our network share information. And what we try to do is really regularly give people updates on different things that are happening at a federal level. Um, as well as always providing ways to take action. So, um, you know, I'll give an example. Just this week, we sent, a, we sent out um, sort of our regular email that has some updates and some action steps. Um, and one thing that um, people may or may not be aware of is that um, the 2020 census, um, there's been a proposal to um, include a question on uh, citizenship status um, and that question has not been fully tested and um, people expect that what what its impact is going to be is that it's going to um, make many fewer immigrants fill out the census whether or not they're undocumented which will ultimately lead to the census determines funding it actually it determines congressional districts as well so heavily immigrant areas will actually lose representation in terms of congressional districts, um, and lots of federal programs will lose funding because of an undercount. So it's going to have really significant health impacts. And so we've, throughout the process of um, this question, we've been encouraging folks to take action um, on preventing the citizenship question. We asked people to give public comment when the public comment period was open. And just this week, um, we sent out an email um, encouraging folks to support um, new federal policy that was introduced. So both the Senate and the House have um, introduced um, a bill called the Census Idea Act, which um, while it doesn't directly address the citizenship question, would in effect um, prevent the citizenship question from being on the 2020 census by requiring that all new questions are really fully um, uh, researched and tested um, before they're actually in the census. And so um, our action alert is asking people to, um, it's brand new legislation, um, it just got introduced in both the House and the Senate, and so asking people to call their legislators and encourage them to sign on as co-sponsors of this legislation. So then I'm sharing that as one example of the kind of things that we send out. Um, and specifically, um, 
you know, when we when we send out um, action alerts, um, we we're sending out things that like anybody can do, right? So anybody can call their legislator. Um, you know, sometimes there's other actions that um, you know that maybe require showing up, but an action. But in general, it's things that you can do from anywhere in the country, like making a phone call. And we really try to provide specific messaging that brings a public health lens in. So as I mentioned you know, part of what we want to do is really shift the narrative to be bringing a public health lens into social justice movements. And so um, as much as possible, we try to encourage um, people, if you are calling your legislator, if you are um, going to tweet about something, right, to bring in some uh, a public health lens of like how this issue connects to health. And in that way, we want to really shift the narrative. Um, and then I'll also just like add that um, up on the screen um, is our Twitter and Facebook um, accounts, and I'd encourage you to follow those as well. Um, in addition to our listserv, we're sharing a lot of action opportunities um, through Twitter in particular, um, and sharing a lot of other um, a lot of other organizations' action alerts. Um, so I'm not sure if that fully answered the question, but the short answer is that get on our listserv and. Um, we'll share lots of opportunities of how to get involved in federal policy. Awesome. Um, so what are some of the challenges you face when outreaching to individuals who are afraid of deportation? Um, so great question. We specifically don't do that work. Um, we, uh, we, our work is really focused on organizing public health professionals to support the work that people are often, often doing in directly impacted communities. Um, so um, I could answer how how that um, how people experience those challenges, but it's it's not really in our wheelhouse. So um, I think I won't. But um, you know, I will say that like in our research work, right? Um, that doing research um, in communities where people do um, have fears of talking to people of, of um, you know, government agencies, um, of sharing information, um, sometimes does make that work challenging. And our research work, um, we're always working with um, a community organization. So we're never just as human impact partners showing up in a community and saying, hey, can we talk to you about your experience as an immigrant, we're working in partnership with an organization who has those relationships. So um, we just finished um, a research project in the Rio Grande Valley in Texas um, on, uh, it was sort of an, an updated report to a report we did a couple years ago on the health impacts of um, immigration enforcement. And so um, to do that research, right, which involved interviews and focus groups, um, we were working directly with an organization called Lupe, who's based there, who has relationships, um, so that they have that trust in the community, um, and and they're making those relations, those connections for us. All right. Um, a follow-up question to the slide you presented about there being three thousand undocumented children who are separated from their families. Um, is there any information about where those children are going or what's happening with them after they're separated? Yeah, so I've encouraged folks to um, check out the news from last week, um, which I alluded to, which is that um, the administration actually just said last week that they think it's unlikely that they'll be able to um, identify where all those children are um, and track them, uh, which is very disturbing. Um, the, I am, I'm not an expert on this, um, but to my understanding, um, it's, it's a mix of things. So um, some is that there's just like not tracking um, that is happening, that um, there wasn't tracking of who the kids were, who their parents were, um, where they went, right? There were detention centers. People sort of thought of it as as being detained at the border, but we were seeing detention centers that were actually all over the country, um, right? So kids were being shipped to New York, to Chicago, to um, Oregon, I think, right? Like all over the country. Um, so some of that tracking just wasn't done. Um, some, you know, some, some of those kids, it doesn't mean all those kids are detained, right? Some have been released and are with their parents and it's just not tracked. 
Um, some, maybe their, their parents may have been uh, deported, but they were connected with family members um, or foster care agencies. Um, and again, there's just, it's not tracked. Um, so, you know, in short, I think it's, we just really don't know, and it appears that the administration doesn't really know either. Horrifying. Um, so keeping in mind that a lot of the participants are undergrad students, what are some things that they can do to help immigrant health, like volunteer opportunities and those types of things? Yeah, great. Um, so I would really encourage you to um, connect with local organizations or um, if there's campus groups um, that are focused on um, immigrant rights and you know I'm not familiar with what what exists um, at your university but um, if there are campus groups that are working on immigrant rights um, I would encourage you to connect with those um, and um, similarly with local organizations that there's not um, immigrant rights groups so I think of local organizations um, you know, it could be a community health clinic, um, it could be an immigrant rights group, um, you know, or other service agency. Um, and if you're particularly interested in sort of bringing in that health lens, I'd encourage you to check out our guide um, and really like dive into um, some of the specifics on like what are the ways that um, these, uh, these issues impact health and then start to have conversations with those groups about like, are there ways to bring that health messaging um, into a campaign or um, information that they're, that they're providing, right? Um, so for example, um, you know, if, um, if you were to connect with a, um, a community clinic, right? And maybe that's as a volunteer, um, you know, I don't know if there's opportunities for volunteering, but if there is, um, most, you know, most clinics maybe haven't seen our guide, and our guide actually has other resources as well. Um, so if you develop that relationship, you know, as a volunteer, um, you could share the guide. And I will say that um, the guide has nine action steps, and a lot of them are like really big, take, you know, will take a lot of internal, um, organizing and um, you know changing policies and something that like as a volunteer or a community member you may not really have access to um, but there are some steps in there that are actually pretty simple to take um, and even just being able to suggest it or point to that resource um, could be done so I showed the photo of a couple different um, clinics who had put up welcoming signage that's one of the easiest things to do um, and you know doesn't take a lot of internal um, work so you know could could a clinic just put up signs that are you know say all are welcome here another really easy thing is um putting out know your rights information um maybe in the lobby of um a clinic so um so i think the first step there is is to, to connect with those organizations find out who's doing that work um and find volunteer opportunities um, and, and then just going back to like, if there is campus groups that are working on um, immigrant rights is kind of think of strategizing, like how can we elevate health as like an issue that um, health is really impacted by what's going on at a political level and like think about like what are action steps that, um, you know, you may be able to do to address that or to even just highlight that as an issue. Um, so a comment slash question here. So as someone on a quest for social justice, how do you suggest approaching the desire for a just and healthy society across party lines? Boom. Easy that is question. a good question. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I think that health is, um, is actually a unifying issue. Um, there is a lot of issues that are really divisive and, you know, kind of don't cross party lines or there's a lot of conflict. And in general, um, most people can agree that all people that people should be healthy, right? You know, Republicans, Democrats, and everything in between have lots of different views about what that looks like, right? Um, you know, everything from 
the healthcare system and how it's funded um, to who should have access to health, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot in there that um, can be broken, can be along party lines, but we could really all agree that um, everyone should be healthy. And um, so, so that's to say that I think that part of what we're doing is elevating um, this message of health and connecting health to other social justice movements, right? Whether it's immigration or criminal justice or anything else. Um, and so, you know, how do we actually use that health message to bridge that divide? And so um, if you're like, you know, just as an example, if you're calling your um, members of Congress about a particular issue, um, it may be hard to call your Republican member of Congress and say, you know, I think this and this and this about immigration, um, and um, and it feels like maybe it feels like a very democratic agenda, and you're like they're not going to listen to me. But what are the ways that you can actually bring in a health messaging to talk to a Republican legislator that's actually, you know, they might hear um, because you can bring up those those principles of health for all. Um, so, so I, I think in some ways it is it is a unifying message, um, and what and I so I would encourage you to um, you know I, I I've been mostly focused on our public health awakened work, but if you check out our um, human impact partners website humanimpact.org, um, we have a lot of research and check out our research um, on all our different issue areas, so housing, um, immigration, criminal justice. Um, land use and transportation, sort of a span of social justice issues, and our research reports talk about those issues from a health lens, right? Um, and so I think those those um, reports can give you sort of an insight on like how do you talk about um, issues that otherwise may be, be divisive in a way that um, brings up health that everyone can get behind. Okay, um, a, a question that kind of tails on that. Um, do you feel that public health professionals becoming actionably involved in social justice issues have the potential to bridge the polarized political gap in a way that is new? Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, yes, I don't think we're there yet. But I think that, yes, um, you know, our network is national. And so, um, you know, I live in California. I live in Oakland. It's a, you know, California is very, liberal and progressive in many ways compared to the rest of the country. Um, and there's a lot of people who say, oh, well, you can do that in California, but what about Nevada? What about elsewhere, right? Um, and so being a national network, um, we're really pulling in public health professionals from all across the US, people who are working in really rural areas, people who are working in really conservative areas, people in liberal cities, right? Like in everything in between. Um, and we're elevating this message of health for all and social justice and health being connected and giving people the resources to do that work. Um, and I think slowly by doing that, we really can um, shift the narrative across party lines, right? So we're not trying to create resources and do work that only work in liberal democratic areas, right? Um, we want things that people can take to their communities in rural and conservative areas and use in the same ways. So I don't think we're there yet, but I think that um, that message can get us there. All right, just a few more questions here and then we'll wrap up for the day. Um, so what have been some of the strategies or methods that Human Impact has utilized in order to engage different entities that have an influence in health equity, but may not really feel connected to that particular issue or are not familiar with what health equity is. Yeah, great. So um, I really focused today on um, our advocacy work at Human Impact Partners, and I mentioned our research work as well. Um, the other big bucket of work that we have is capacity building. And so um, that work is really focused on um, building the capacity of public health, um, and in particular public health departments to do health equity work. Um, and so, uh, while, um, you know, many health departments are really not thinking about health equity, um, so we do 
trainings um, and workshops and um, to within health, public health departments um, that talk about what health equity is, why it's important, um, and how it's connected to other work, right? So for folks that are working in traditional public health settings um, and maybe not thinking about health equity, um, we really break down um, health equity, the social determinants of health, um, power imbalances, right? How power and oppression, as I mentioned, relate to health and health equity. Um, and then give people tools to um, be able to do that work. Um, in addition to the, the um, trainings that we're doing with health departments, we also have um, a, uh, we have a cohort, an institute of, that's a year and a half long program for folks who work in public health departments to actually um, come together a couple times during the year and learn together um, and then take leadership within their um, public health agencies to do health equity work um, and giving folks a, like a cohort of folks to um, be able to think through how they do that and how they shift their institutions. So sort of on the um, public health department side, um, and then through Public Health the Weekend, um, the tools and the messaging that we're using um, and, uh, you know, our different strategies, as well as with um, our Health and the Punishment Program, more on the criminal justice side, um, are giving people those sort of tools and skills that they hopefully can bring back into spaces beyond health departments, whether it's universities or organizations or just their, you know, day-to-day -day life to um, to be bringing a message of health equity. Okay. Um, and then could you just talk a little bit about what your current campaigns are and if you're working in other countries? Yeah, so we are not working in other countries. Um, we have some people on our list who are based in other countries, um, but we're specifically at right now focused um, on the U.S. Um, and right now, mostly uh, focused on federal policy. Um, we are really interested in shifting to having um, a local um, chapter model where we would um, be starting to organize the local level and looking at state and local policies as well. But right now, um, we're really focused at a federal level. So um, a couple of the campaigns that um, we are involved in and um, sort of not, we're not really leading our own, but I mentioned the um, the 2020 census uh, citizenship question. That's something that we've been engaged with um, uh, since it was first proposed and are continue to track and follow to um, do that. Um, another um, thing that we're really focused on is um, uh, shifting the narrative around taxes. Um, so this work came out of um, the um, tax reform that was happening last year. Um, and we really want to shift the narrative that um, people think of taxes as very negative. Um, and we believe that taxes actually are what funds a lot of health, um, right? And that um, the, that we want to shift the narrative so that people think of taxes as something that can make our communities healthy um, and allow us to thrive. And so we had a, a whole campaign around tax day last year, and we're going to do that again this year um, to sort of elevate this narrative of taxes and health um, and relate that to different policies that are happening. Um, another one has been, if folks are familiar with um, public charge, um, which is uh, basically the administration is trying to change a rule that would make it harder for um, people to get a green card if them or their children have ever used um, public assistance and that includes um, Medicaid, it includes food stamps um, and so um, that we just did a big push to get people to do public comments around this rule change um, opposing it, bringing in a health lens um, and we're tracking that campaign as it moves forward to figure out how we can um, insert ourselves um, as public health folks to bring that health messaging into that campaign and make sure that rule change doesn't go through. Um, so that's, that's a couple of the, the, the campaigns we're more focused on. Um, and then 
but we also like pay attention to other things as they come up and some, sometimes just like one-off small actions and sometimes they're more closely tracking an issue. Thank you. Um, so then just one final comment here back to the question about volunteer opportunities. So um, the Progressive Leadership Alliance of Nevada is the local entity that takes volunteers. Uh, their website is planimmigration.org um, and they've got a number of events in the Reno area, I guess. So uh, definitely check that out. Yeah, planimmigration.org. Uh, so Great. thank you for, for sharing that information, Allison. Um, all right, thank you very much. This was, uh, yeah, fantastic talk. I, I certainly learned a lot today. Um, so yeah, thank you. Uh, keep doing such great and amazing work. Thank you. And please feel free if folks want to reach out. Um, I'm happy to answer further questions. All right. Thanks, everyone. See ya. Thank you.